But J Jeremy, just to welcome you formally, how are you? Yeah, I'm good, Mark. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you. It's great to see you. Uh, I know that you're always busy, but um, can you possibly just tell us about what you've been up to the last few weeks and what that's been like for you? Sure. So, greetings everyone from the deep south, from Kent. London is the north for us, although Scotland has a great place in my heart, not least that our daughter went to St Andrews and met her husband there. He's an American, but nobody's perfect, right? <laughs> a Scot would have been preferable, but there we are. Can't have everything. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm with my other children. So we've got three 20, between 20 and 24 year olds here. And they're basically eating me out of house and home. They just eat all the time. So that's the main sort of challenge to find a online delivery service as, as I'm gonna come on to in a minute. I'm sort of nervous about going out. So um, yeah, we've been keeping the um, farm shops of Seven Oaks busy the last few weeks. <laughs> Good. Good. <coughs> You mentioned there a little bit just about your family situation. Can you tell us a wee bit more just about your, your setup down south and your, and your family sure. situation? There? I'm, married, I'm married to Jeanette and we've got three, uh, three children, Naomi, who's the one who, who went to St Andrews. She's doing a PhD now. She's got the anthropology bug at St Andrews and can't, can't escape from it. And then we've got two boys plus one of their girlfriends here, Nat and Sam. Nat works in a tech company in London. And um, Sam, our youngest, yeah, he's at Manchester um, doing geography. Um, he, he's not very sad about his exams being cancelled, but he is sad about missing the cricket season. So, yeah, that's that's Great. where we are. Great. Well, Jeremy, I'm going to hand over to you. If you want to just uh, lead us through, share your, share your story with us. Uh, and then, as I say, at the end, we'll, we'll open up to some questions. But please do be thinking about questions. Feel free to type questions uh, at any point. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. So just to give you all my, my story, I regret to say I'm a banker. Yeah, terrible, right? Terrible profession. And um, I worked for about 30 years all over the world, mainly with Credit Suisse. And then about uh, 12 years ago, I became chief executive, as Mark mentioned, of the UK's oldest private bank, C. Hor & Co., it's on the 12th generation of family ownership and after 340 years they had an experiment to bring in an outsider which was me and uh, the bank is still afloat which is great so in many ways i had a, a dream life i've been married for 30 years a great job really interesting and then one day about uh, seven eight years ago i felt a tiny lump on my ribs in the shower and um, i went to the gp who said uh, it's nothing really to worry about it's just a fatty lump but then you get referred from person to person and maybe some of you have, have seen that yourself or, or with loved ones where each person you go to says i'm not sure what that is and eventually i got referred to the marsden which only does one thing cancer and they said you've got this rare type of cancer uh, it's called sarcoma sarcoma which is cancer of the muscle tissue but um, we've caught it fairly early and we should be able to treat you. So for about six months, I went through treatment. And then for about two years, everything was fine and life went back to normal. And um, then one day, about five years ago, 2015, um, I was at a friend's house having dinner and uh, I went to adjust my collar just here. And I felt this massive lump on my collarbone, not a tiny pea, like a golf ball under the skin. And within a few seconds, my life changed forever because I went back to the hospital and um, they ran tests. And then a few days later, I was sitting in the waiting room and the nurse said, please come through. We walked down a narrow corridor, maybe 20 feet. And on the way, she simply said, I'm really sorry. And that was the only warning I had because when I went into the room, there were a bunch of people there I hadn't met. And they said, well, we're sorry that we missed this and we don't know how it's missed, been missed in the screening, but you've got tumors everywhere and um we can't cure you they're, they're inoperable and um yeah so obviously the next question i asked is um well how long do you think i've got to live and they said 18 months and i, I burst into tears so please don't think i'm some kind of amazing christian or cancer expert not at all i'm just an ordinary person going through life and, and life with cancer is hard so in the last five years i've been through i've had 24 chemos about a dozen operations radiotherapy. I also had big problems with my eyes. I lost the sight in both eyes, one after the other. I got it back in one eye. And um, it's amazing actually how low the legal requirement for driving eyesight is. 
So I've only hit four cars in the last few weeks. So I have been able to drive again, which is good. Um, it's hard cancer. Um, it's physically hard. And um, yeah, as, as Mark was saying, I would say to everybody, welcome to my world. Because for the last five years, if I was in chemotherapy, which most, I'm not in chemo now, but most of the time I have been, and you're on public transport and someone coughs or sneeze, you feel very nervous because you've got no immune system. And now everybody feels like that. So my experience, I'm, I'm sorry to say, has become to some extent everybody's experience. But I guess I'm, I'm doubly nervous now because I particularly don't want to go to hospital at the moment with a sort of poor life expectancy for obvious reasons. So what's, um, what's helped me in, in cancer? Well, I would say it's the experience of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at this point, I appreciate some of you watching may not be Christians at all, and that's fine. And please, if you're a bit skeptical about any of this, hear me out and please do ask questions. And as Mark said, you know, ask anything. What, what do I mean by that? Well, I think that God speaks to us in a number of ways, but particularly he speaks to us through his word, which Christians believe is, is the Bible. And when, for example, I'm wheeled in for operations, and I've had a lot, it, it's, it's nerve wracking because you think, well, will I come round or what are they going to find? And then the words of the Lord Jesus come to my mind. Look, I'll, I'll never leave you or forsake you or uh, I'm with you always, even to the very end of the age. Or maybe the most famous chapter in the Bible, the 23rd Psalm. In it, God says this, he, uh, the, the psalmist says this. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Yes, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you're with me. So God doesn't promise us a bypass around the valley of the shadow of death. And in a way, friends, we're all having forced into the valley that I've been in for the last five years, where death is suddenly a, a, an imminent threat. And, and, you know, we all think, well, what happens if I get coronavirus? And the presence of, of God in my life has, has really made a a massive difference. I couldn't imagine trying to face cancer, trying to face death without that. And it gives me hope. The, the book, which sadly I don't make any money of, I must be getting soft in my old age, Beyond the Big Sea. The subtitle is Hope in the Face of Death. And I wrote that a few months ago, pre-coronavirus. The Big Sea is cancer, but it could be, it could be coronavirus. Now, at this point, I imagine some of you are thinking, okay, well, if there is a God, um, who loves us and cares for us, then, then how, how can coronavirus happen? What, why, does, why doesn't he do something about it? Well, I think, friends, that's a great question. I'm not sure I have a 100% answer to that, but this, this I do know. The Bible tells us that this world is as if we're in bed. Imagine, imagine you're in bed at night in your house and you hear breaking glass and you realise you've got intruders in your house and you can't get them out. So the house, if you like, the world was made by God good, but intruders came in and the intruders are suffering, sin and, and death, and we can't get them out. And our, our basic problem is that, in fact, not so much physical death, it's what the Bible calls eternal death, which is separation from God. Now, there are some evil things in the world that come through natural causes like coronavirus, but if we're honest, and I certainly, I'm a banker, right? So I know that better than most. There's also evil within each one of us. Each one of us, the Bible says, have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So our basic problem is that our relationship with God is broken. Now, why doesn't God do something about coronavirus, about suffering? Well, friends, I, I believe he has. And I, I find that amazingly helpful in cancer. A man called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was a German pastor who stood up against the persecution of the Jews and he was executed just before the war ended by, on, on Hitler's orders. And just before that happened, he smuggled out of his jail cell a little piece of paper and on it he wrote this, only a suffering God can help us. Only a suffering God can help us. That's the Christian claim that God suffered. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, how can, if there is an infinite God who made the universe 75 trillion light years across, how, how can he suffer? Well, Christians believe he suffered because he became a human being. And Jesus, friends, felt fear. And I, the dominant emotion I feel in cancer is fear. It's fear, fear of, of, of dying. And Jesus felt fear as well, and I find that amazing. 
in the Bible, we read that he was in a garden called Gethsemane the night before he was crucified. And he could see the soldiers coming to arrest him. And, and he was afraid. And he prayed, Father, if it's your will, take this cup, the cup of suffering away from me. But let not my will, but your will be done. So why did Jesus choose to go through suffering? I, I have no choice. I have to go through it. But Jesus had a choice. He could have, he could have easily uh, escaped. But he didn't because Christians believe that the cross is the only way back to God, the only way to remake our broken relationship with God, the only way to, to pay the bill for all the things we've done wrong, the only way to bring us back from exile. And what motivated Jesus to go to the cross? Love. That's what the Bible says, that he loves us. The Bible says God's patient, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to faith in him. Now, just my final question would be would be this that um when I, when I do these talks often people say to me yeah it's just wishful thinking isn't it and um I, I understand that because I guess I would suggest there are two I realize it's more complicated than this but there are basically two options one is the Richard Dawkins one atheism that everything is meaningless if you read Dawkins and he's nothing if not consistent he says that the universe just speaks to us of blind pitiless indifference there is no meaning there is nothing beyond death even dna doesn't really have a purpose even the coronavirus doesn't really have a purpose apart from perpetuating itself or does the christian hope that someone came back from beyond the grave someone defeated death and that's a very powerful human longing eddie izzard the comedian he was recently interviewed in the guardian and he said this that all his life he's been traumatized by the death of his mother from cancer when, when Eddie was six or seven. And if only she or someone had come back through the clouds to tell us there's something there. Well, that, friends, is the Christian hope. Yes, that someone did come back. That's what Easter is all about. It's about the triumph of Jesus Christ over death. And that means there is hope on offer in the face of death. However, coming back to the wishful thinking question, it's only helpful if it's true. The Christian message is only helpful if the Christian message is true. Otherwise, it absolutely is wishful thinking. In fact, it's the biggest contract in history. So if you're watching this and you're not a Christian or you're not sure or you think, well, maybe, maybe not. What I'd say is look at the evidence, decide for yourself. That's why I'm a Christian, because I believe it's true. I'm going to define in a second what I mean by it's true. Because if we look at anything in life, we, we, we analyze it, don't we? Let's take a stupid example. We go and buy a car. What do we do? We research a car. We go and look under the engine. We kick the tires. We test drive it. It's the same thing on the Christian faith. I'm not asking you to take a leap in the dark. I'm asking you this question. On the morning of Easter Sunday, AD 33 or 34, did what the eyewitness accounts say actually happen or not? Did the stone get rolled away and Jesus came back conquering death? If it didn't happen, it's the biggest contract in history, right? A roughly a third of the people on the planet believe that that, that happens. And, and it, it could be a contract. I happen to believe it's true, but you have to decide for yourself because it's only helpful in the face of death if it's true. And I believe that the evidence in the eyewitness accounts is overwhelmingly strong. And I would just ask you, have an open mind, please. Have an open mind. Look at one of the eyewitness accounts, Mark or other people at the Tron would be really happy to chat with you about it and be as skeptical as you like and be as skeptical as you like, please, in the questions. So my summary is this. There is hope, friends. There is hope in the face of death. That's been my experience. That's the experience of billions of Christians all over the world. And it's based on a historical fact that I believe is true, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Thanks so much for listening. And I'm really happy to answer any questions you've got. Jeremy, thanks so much for just sharing so honestly, so eloquently, so clearly um, about your situation and about how you, how you find life and how you deal with that. Uh, thank you so much. Um, guys, I'm, I'm looking at the screen and I can see that there's uh, a few questions coming in. Um, so please, if you'd like to ask questions, please do uh, make this as uh, practical and as useful for you as, as possible. Uh, as Jeremy said, uh, any question is, is on the table, uh, so please feel free to do that. Um, I'm just going to kick off with, with a question here. Um, 
How, how does your faith help you uh, practically uh, day to day? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. I, I would I would illustrate this by telling a story. So, Professor John Lennox, who some of you may have heard of, he's a professor of maths at Oxford. He was coming back on a train recently, and sitting opposite him was another professor who um, recognised him and said, "Oh, it's it's John Lennox, isn't it?" And Lennox said, "Yes." And then the other professor said, "What are you reading?" And he said, "Oh, I'm reading the Bible." And the professor laughed and said, the Bible, what do you want to read that for? And Lennox said, oh, it gives me hope. And then he looked at, Lennox looked at the other guy and said, how about you, do you have hope? And the man says, oh, I hope everything works out for the best. And Lennox looked him in the eye and said, no, that's not what I mean. I mean, do you have personal hope? And the other man said, no, none whatsoever. So what difference does it make? It gives me hope, it gives me hope. Otherwise, humanly, I don't have hope because I can't be cured. The chemotherapy shrinks the tumours and then they grow again. So there's no, there's no way out humanly of this dilemma, if you like, I'm in. But I, I find it amazing that there is hope. And when I look at um, the Bible stories, um, that's what I, the eyewitness accounts, that's what I see there as well, that, that Jesus brings to these defeated, demoralised people hope. So just very briefly, there's two people on the road to Emmaus on Easter Sunday morning and they've given up. They've got, they're running away. They're, they're actually going, I guess a lot of people in London and maybe Glasgow do, they're going to their country retreat to escape the danger. And Jesus comes alongside them and says, what's the matter? And they say, oh, are you stupid? Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened? Blah, blah, blah. Then Jesus doesn't say, I'm Jesus. He, he Interesting enough, he opens up his word. He opens up the Bible, the, the Hebrew scriptures. Anyway, at the end of the story, eventually their eyes are open and they see Jesus and then what do they say and that's been my experience too they say this were not our hearts burning within us as you talked to us along the way so I find my heart by nature because of my dilemma because of my illness is is not warm it's cold and what does hope do it warms me up it warms my heart and that personal word from the Lord Jesus I believe is available to us all to, to us all. So what difference does it make? Every day it gives me hope. Thanks, Jeremy. Thank you for, for, for that answer. Here, here's a, a question that, that, that may actually kind of fall along the similar lines, but maybe a slightly different angle. Um, it says here, is Christianity really only for those who are near death or dying? What <laughs> difference, does it, what difference yeah. does it make to me if I am young, fit and well? Yeah. That's a, that's, a, that, that's a very fair question. I think, friend, I would say, first of all, we're all going to meet God. We're all going to meet God. The Bible says that it's given to humans once to live, once to die, and after that, the judgment. So each of us is going to have to give an account to, to God for, for, for what we've done, and, and especially for the things that we've, we've done wrong. Now, is there a particular imperative on that facing death? Yes, and I would say that's been my experience for me personally and also for many people in the last few months because death, if you're young, seems very remote. But I think that the, the starting point in finding God is to realise that you have a problem. Yeah, and, and there's a story in the Bible about that, um, which is Jesus told of two brothers. The younger one, he says to his father, I wish you were dead. He goes to a far country, wastes all his money. And he's in the pigsty, which for a Jewish boy, that's the worst place to be. And then it says he came to his senses and he realized I have a problem. Now, sometimes the pigsty doesn't look like a pigsty, but actually this world is leading to death. And even if you're 20 and you live to 100, eventually each of us has to die. Isn't that strange? We prepare for everything in life, everything. We prepare for holidays, for work, for family, but we don't prepare for death, which is the one thing that's inevitable. And again, each of us will meet God. And our problem is not physical death, it's this eternal death. So even if you're 20 and you live to 100, and I hope that's the case, one day each one of us must face the judgment seat of God and give an account for ourselves. So my question then is, are you ready? And we don't know when we're gonna die. We could die tomorrow, we could die in 80 years time, but each one of us is gonna meet God face to face. Thank you, Jeremy, thank you so much. Guys, thank you so much for the questions. There's lots of questions. So I'm struggling a little bit to listen to Jeremy's answer and also look at these questions coming in. So uh, bear with me. 
You um, don't do don't do multitasking then, Mark. <laughs> no, no, and you've seen me, unfortunately. Yes. Um, okay. Here's there, there's a, a couple of um, questions from people that maybe don't have the same faith as as you. Uh, here, here's a question from someone that um, that does. Uh, they say that they, they work, they're uh, a nurse, a student nurse, and they work with a lot of people in uh, very difficult situations. Um, and really, I suppose their, their question here is, um, how do you share that with, with other people in these difficult situations? How do you do that sensitively, yeah. caringly, lovingly? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a very tough question. My, my wife was a nurse, so I have some idea of, of, of that. But... Um, I think we need friends if we're Christians in this in this dark hour we need two things and we those two things we both see in the Lord Jesus so how do we need to relate to people we need to be like him and if I think of another story in the Bible the widow of Nain you can look it up in Luke chapter 7 another eyewitness account Jesus meets this grieving widow carrying the body of her dead son to, to be buried and he does two things he's very kind the Lord Jesus, friends, is very kind and full of compassion. And he says to her, don't cry. So we should be like that. We should be full of compassion and kindness and gentleness. But he also then says to the, the, the widow's dead son, get up. And he gives, he gives her back, gives, gives the boy back to his mother and reverses. The, the, the funeral cortege does a U-turn it goes back. Now, we can't do that because we're not God. But we know someone who is God. So yeah, we should, we should also take the gospel opportunity to share that. Now, how do we do that? I would say we should ask people questions. Now, whether you can do that in a hospital, I don't know. I've never worked in a hospital, but in general, I think just to ask people questions and my, my three questions, if this is a word here for the Christians, are, are this, this is just me, you can draw your own. Number one, do you mind me asking, do you have any particular beliefs? Everybody has some beliefs. Ask, ask people what they are. Two, did you ever look at the Bible? Because it's not about us. Christians, we don't believe we're better than anyone. We believe we found, we've been told about something that's amazing, that's life-giving, that's transformational. How have we been told about that? Through the Bible. And then thirdly, and again, I appreciate in a hospital context, that may not be possible. I'm talking in general. Um, would you like to have a chat with me? Um, uh, would you like to have a chat with me about the Bible? Now, in a context where you can't do that, my go-to thing would just be, if I had an opportunity, and I've been at people's deathbed dying, would just be saying either, would you mind if I prayed for you? Or would you mind if I read a psalm? This incredible intrinsic healing power, I believe, in the psalms. And if you can't think of, well, which psalm do I read? I go to the best known one, which is 23, right? The Lord's my shepherd because ultimately the power is in God's word. So that would be my, my advice. But look, you know, I, I don't really know is the short answer. And I, I'm not sure any of us do, but I also believe that God helps us when we're in a situation like that. What can we do? We can just pray, God, help me to be kind and help me to tell people about Jesus. Thanks, Jeremy. I think that's a, a very, very helpful answer indeed. Here's another question. You've obviously um, were very successful in your career. Here's a question that says, do you regret spending so much time and effort on your career before you were diagnosed? Yes. Yes, I do. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't think it's wrong to work. I don't think as Christians we're called to like, you know, laze around, lie on the sofa all day. Work is a good thing. The Bible opens with God at work. But we're all tempted in different ways. And yeah, if you're in business, uh, but also maybe in other professions, then the temptation is to make your career and to make, frankly, money your God. Now, I was a Christian when I entered the, the city of London. Um, but, yeah, we're all tempted. And um, the danger in the city is to worship money. And I, I spent most of my career in private banking, which is dealing with the world's wealthiest people. I can tell you some of them are the most miserable people you've ever met, because having lots of money does not make you happy. So, yeah, I do regret that I worked too hard my wife's fairly tolerant and forgiving and in conclusion i would say nobody on their deathbed says i wish i'd spent more time in the office which again is this point about preparing oh yeah that's a question i guess i'd ask each of you are you ready to die are you ready to die if you're a christian 
the, the, the wonderful thing we have is that Jesus will never leave us alone. We'll never, never be alone. But if we're not his, we don't have that, that promise. So that I think is my, my regret. Yeah, that I worked too hard and annoyed my wife, but we're still married, so that's good. <laughs> Maybe there's a natural follow-on. Thank you. Um, question here says, we are a married couple living with terminal cancer. Uh, what has marriage meant to you through your, uh, through your cancer? And maybe just marriage and family. Yeah, it's been tough. If my wife was here, she, she doesn't like talking about it. She doesn't mind me doing it, but she doesn't like hearing me speak, not least because she's heard it before. And also she's a very private person. So I think everybody reacts to cancer in different ways but it's it's been a strain on our our marriage that we've been married 33 years and the hardest five years have been the the hardest years have been the last five years with cancer why because it, it just creates tremendous uncertainty it's so hard it's hard to plan anything you know again welcome to my world but things like holidays and what you're going to do next month it's kind of a waste of time planning what I believe is, though, that God gives us grace for the situation we're in. Um, the other shock for my wife was suddenly having me arrive. You know, she used to complain that um, you're always at work, and now she complains you're always at home. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the old joke: I've married you for better, for worse, but not for lunch. So it has been hard. <laughs> it's also been it's also been hard uh, on the on the children. The hardest thing I had to do was to go home from the hospital. And then, as I mentioned, our name was at St. Andrews, the other boys were at Manchester and Lancaster, to drive, I didn't want to tell them on the phone, so to drive around the UK and tell them. That was really hard because you know what's going to happen. They're pleased to see you, but you know you're about to make them sad. And that's really, that's really tough. That's really tough. So I thank God for my wife for her forgiveness. Um, and the hardest thing about cancer is the impact it has on your family much harder i would say than the the physical suffering um but at the same time family is is great i mean i'm, I'm just I'm, every day i'm so grateful to be alive and last year our daughter got married as i mentioned and i could walk her down the aisle i just felt that was such a such a privilege so um look we're i think the other thing when you're thrown closely together is that my wife of course is perfect but i'm a sinner and the closer you are together the more you see the more you see others' faults. So that's also hard if you're, if you're basically very, very hard, you know, very, very closely tied together. But fortunately, God gives grace. And fortunately, also, the Christian faith isn't about me being a good person, because I'm not. It's about him forgiving us for all the things we've done wrong. Jeremy, thanks so much for, for your uh, answers. Just, just before I move on to the, the last question, I'm just going to ask one more question. But... That uh, comment, sorry, the last comment said, uh, by the way, we've given away 35 of your books already. Uh, oh, and we pray they'll be used by God. So uh, well done. This, the sales tally's gone up, Jeremy. So yeah, that's, that's right. Great. Check Checks in the post. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you mentioned, um, you mentioned, I mean, and, and thank you to everyone that's um, just uh, texted in questions and so on. Sorry, we can't get through them all. Uh, just, it might feel strange because you can probably just see me speaking and Jeremy speaking, but there's, uh, I can see there's 64 of us involved in this conversation today. So that's, that's brilliant to uh, just a wide range of people. The questions are obviously very varied as well from the different um, viewpoints and lots of things. So thank you for, for that. But Jeremy, just as we finish, um, you mentioned there as you gave some advice about um, talking sensitively to people that are in difficult situations. You said lastly, maybe invite them to, to look at the Bible. Um, now, you've obviously done that with a, a number of people. Could you maybe just tell us a little bit about how you've done that and who you've done that with and how that's how that has been for you and for them? Yeah, sure. So um, I, this is done to do with coronavirus. But for the last five years, I've been asking my friends those three questions because I believe I have something amazing. Nothing to do with me. Somebody else gave it to me. I want to pass it on as if I had a cure for coronavirus, which I don't. If I did. I want to tell everybody about it, right? You want to make the whole world know. So that's, that's how I feel. And what I ask people is just very simple. You know, give me 20, 25 minutes. And that's why I'd ask you if you're, if you're watching and you wouldn't call yourself a Christian. And again, thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate you taking the time. Just ha have a look. Is this hope real? And the book that 
um, Mark and I are particularly delighted to get into is, is something called the Word One to One, which is simply John's Gospel with notes. So you've got John's Gospel, one of the four eyewitness accounts of Jesus's life. John was one of Jesus's closest friends. And then just questions and answers on the other side, explanatory notes, if you like. And I just sit in a coffee shop. Now, you can't do that now, but we can do it having a Zoom coffee or something. And we just chat with my, my friend and I. I have about maybe a dozen or so people I do it with. And I just try and answer their questions. And uh, it's not a course. You don't need to sign up for anything. It's just a chance for you to try and figure out for yourself. Yeah, is G it, really the question is, is Jesus who he says he is? Is he the son of God? And does he offer us uh, eternal life? And I believe that he does. And I believe that God doesn't play hide and seek. God doesn't play hide and seek. In fact, the Bible says that if you seek me with all your heart, you will surely find me. If we genuinely look for God and say, okay, God, if you're there, please show yourself to me. He will. I mentioned that verse before. God's patient. He doesn't want any to perish, any to be separated from him, but everyone to come to eternal life. So please take a take a few minutes have a zoom coffee with i'm sure mark or, or other friends in in the tron would be delighted to do that and have a look for yourself jeremy i've said this a number of times but i do i do want to make sure you're absolutely clear about it thank you so much for for sharing with us uh, it's been really really helpful really engaging uh, and really uh, thought-provoking and what you've shared uh, and thank you for just giving the obvious energy uh, to this as well so Unfortunately, we can't all thank you in, in the, the normal sort of way, but we, I do want to just express thanks on behalf of, of, of everyone here today. So thank you very much. It's an honour. Thank you. As, as, we, as we finish, um, I'm just going to put a couple of things on, on the screen uh, that hopefully you can see. Um, so, yeah, just we'll finish in a couple of minutes. But, um, this is Jeremy's book. I don't know if you heard that Jeremy's got a book, but he's mentioned it a couple of times, and it's a, it's a thrilling read. Uh, I've got a copy of it. I read it, I read it on, on the train. It's about 80 or 90 pages. You can read it in a few hours. It's very, very good. Um, so I would really encourage you to look at that. You can get those, uh, get a copy from 10 of um, and get more than one and pass it on to people. But what, what I really want to stress to you is, is what a hopeful book uh, and, and a time where people are, are lacking hope in, in, in all sorts of ways, I'm sure. Uh, and I don't say that in a condescending way, but really just a, a reality. Where do we go for hope? So it's such a hopeful book. It's a very honest book. Uh, and if you're interested in hearing more of what Jeremy's been talking about, uh, then please, uh, please get that. But also, I just want to, um, if you're, Jeremy said some many, many thought provoking things. Um, and I just want to say that. Um, some of the claims that he's been talking about are very, very big claims. Uh, and he's been honest enough to say that they're only uh, real claims if they're true. Uh, and therefore, if you're um, not a Christian or you, you know, maybe you just have questions you'd like to ask or things you'd like to find out more about, then these are two ways that you can, that you can look into this. Um, as I say, I'm a member of the Tron Church and we've got services all the time that you can stream into just now. So there's a link if you'd like to just find out more for yourself uh, and look into that, then please do. Um, and also, if you'd like to, to, to look at one of the Gospels for yourself, uh, then the word one-to-one -one is, is one way of doing that. Uh, and I'd certainly be delighted to, to chat with you if you want to get in touch over email or, or others or just friends who invited you today. Uh, maybe it'll be a chance for you just to say, why don't we grab a coffee or a beer over Zoom and, and, and have a look at, you know, 18 sentences and see what they're like. Uh, so I really want to just commend these, these things to you as well. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I hope you found it useful, helpful. Uh, I'm sure you have. Uh, and, and if we do it again, we'll let you know. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheerio.